Hey guys, we're solving this bio paper today. This is 9700 variant 13, October November 2021. Let's begin. Let's talk about the threshold. Wait a second. So, A was at 26, B was at 22, C was at 18, D was at 15, and E was at 12. So that's very low comparatively. So A star was probably at around 30 to 32. That's what you needed to get an A star for this paper. So you can test yourself. If you get that mark, you're good enough, okay? <clears throat> but it's always good to aim around um, 34 to 35, just to be safe, okay? So let's begin. Starting with, starting with question one. A student would, uh, was asked to use the scale bar shown to calculate the magnification of a cell on a photomicrograph. Which method could the student use to calculate the magnification of the cell? Okay. So we know that magnification is equal to image by actual. Divide the diameter of the cell by the length of the scale bar with both measured in the same units of length. Measure the diameter of the cell in millimeters, multiply by 2000 and divide by the length of the scale bar measured in millimeters. Measure the length of the scale bar in millimeters, convert to micrometers and divide by 2. Measure the length of the scale bar in millimeters, convert to micrometers and multiply by 2. Okay, so magnification is equal to image length by actual length, right? So we need to understand something. What's the best answer here? The answer is actually C. I'll tell you why. So we are going to use a scale, right? We're going to use a scale to measure the length of this bar in millimeters, okay? Then we are going to convert that to micrometers. So that's the image length, right? And this two micrometers is actually the actual length. Understood? So since both of them have the same units, we don't need to convert it anymore, right? And then magnification is equal to? Uh, image length, the one we just found out using the scale, converted it to micrometers, then divide by 2 to get, you know, um, the magnification. That's it. So, clearly D is wrong because multiplication is involved. Uh, we need to divide it. And the other ones, we aren't supposed to find out the diameter of the cell. Okay, that's the wrong method. Remember that. For two, which statements about light microscopy are always correct? The greater the resolution, the greater the detail that can be seen. I agree with this 100%. This is right. The greater the magnification, the greater the detail. No. With magnification, you also require resolution. So two is wrong. And we just figured out that one is correct, right? So it has to be B. Increasing the magnification up to its limit of resolution allows more detail to be seen. Now this is good. Th this makes a lot of sense, right? Um, the shorter the wavelength of light used, the greater the detail, right? The shorter the wavelength, the greater the resolution, okay? This, this is also true. So one, three, and four are two. Number three, what is the length of a typical prokaryote such as E. coli, Escherichia coli? So it's going to be C. It's around 1.5 micrometers. This is a this is a bacterium. 
Okay. So, what's the typical length of a battery? Huh? 1.5 micrometer works. Okay. Like, this would have been too much. What's the typical length of a bacterium, if you guys want to know? It's about 5 to 10. 5 to 10. It's around 5 to 10 micrometers, right? And for a eukaryote, this is for a prokaryote. For a eukaryote, it's like 10 to 100 micrometers, okay? So 1.5 is the best one since um, it's okay. I mean, it's fine, right? Because if you look at these, uh, what about these? These are at, um, this is 150 nanometers or 0 0.15 micrometers. That's too small. 0.15 is too small. Mm, this is uh, 15 micrometers, right? So 15 is a bit bigger than 10. So 1.5 is, yeah, it's the better one. Think of it as 1 to 10, all right? Prokaryote should be around 1 to 10 micrometers, typically. Moving on to 4. 4 should be, what are present in plasmodium? So remember, guys, prokaryotes do not have... So... Prokaryotes do not have membranous organelles. But remember, this was a trick question. Plasmodium is actually a eukaryote. It falls under the uh, okay domain eukarya, but the kingdom is actually protoctista. It is a protoctist, which is a eukaryote. So it actually has both, all three, ribosomes, mitochondria, and Golgi body. Okay, You'll learn about this more in A2. Plasmodium fall under the kingdom protoctista, and they are in the domain eukarya. Which cell structures may contain a nucleic acid? Important question. The answer to this should be 1, 2, and 3. Ribosome contains rRNA. Chloroplast contains everything. DNA, rRNA, everything. Okay. Cytoplasm also contains tRNA, you know. And indirectly it contains a nucleus. So, Golgi body does not contain. A nucleic acid. Which row shows correct features of ATP? The carbohydrate in ATP. Cytoproduction production of ATP. Okay, this is an important question. ATP is produced in both mitochondria and chloroplast. Remember that. Both of them have the electron transport chain. This is the first thing you'll learn soon. In A2. Now, what about the sugar? Is it deoxyribose or pentose, to be exact? Adenosine, triphosphate. It's a pentose sugar, right? Adenosine, triphosphate. It contains the nitrogenous base, adenine, a ribose sugar, and three ATPs. So remember, it's not a deoxyribose sugar. It's a ribose sugar. Okay. Seven. Which tests uh, will identify biological molecules that contain monomers with a carboxylic carboxyl group? So this question was discontinued. I'm seeing the mark scheme. Uh, it was discontinued. Let me just see the examiner's report. Paper 1, 3, question number 7, right? It was discontinued. So I'm not going to solve this actually since it was discontinued. Basically, this is for reducing sugars, right? And uh, this is for proteins, right? And what is ethanol used for? It's used for the eth emulsion test for fats. So basically, uh, they made a mistake in the question. Let's not solve seven. There's no answer for that. Eight, which polysaccharide is correctly described? Amylopectin does not contain beta-glucose. Amylose contains uh, beta -glu alpha-glucose, right? And it is used for storage. That's true. Be correct. Which formula represents a saturated fatty acid? Okay, which contains... Which formula contains or represents, sorry, a saturated fatty acid? 
So let's try to understand this. Look at this. CH3, CH2, CH2, COH. CH3, CH2, 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 COH. If you look at the molecular formula, what you're going to see is this is actually C4, H3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, O2. This is C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, H10, O2. Try to see the trend. For a saturated fatty acid, do you see the ratio of carbon to hydrogen? What is it? Isn't it 1 is to 2? Do you see that? So out of all these four, where do you see a 1 is to 2 ratio? 18 is to 36. That's 1 is to 2, right? That's why A is the answer. In the other ones, you won't see a 1 is to 2 ratio. Those are unsaturated fatty acids, okay? We've seen a similar question in February 2022. This is really important. Which molecules always contain at least four double bonds? We need four double bonds. Okay, at least four. So the triglyceride, it contains three, three ester bonds. So there are three double bonds there, right? But how are we sure that there's going to be a fourth one? In the triglyceride, there are three for sure, but the fourth one depends on the nature of the fatty acids. So we can't say for sure. Uh, we can't. So basically, triglycerides are cancelled. Okay, it has to be C. Right? Ten should be C. Because uh, why hemoglobin and collagen? They are proteins, right? You have multiple peptide bonds, so you're gonna get multiple double bonds from the C O N H. Easy. Moving on. Which way about the structure of proteins is correct? The number of amino the primary structure is not the number of amino acids. This is a misconception, okay? The order of amino acids present, true. The coiling of the chain of amino acids to form beta plate sheet, okay? The shape formed by following a polypeptide and held together by hydrogen bonds only. Uh, it's held together by other bonds as well. So B is not the best one. The result of translation of an mRNA molecule by a ribosome into a chain of amino acids occurs between attraction between hydrogen and oxygen atoms in side chains. It's not from the side chain. Side chains refer to tertiary structures only. Okay? So not C. The sequence of amino acids true formed by hydrogen bonding between amino acids forming the primary structure. This is true, not the side chains, the uh, CONH from the amino acids formed the result of interaction of side chains. Tertiary goes with side chains, right? 11 is D, right? 12. Which statement about collagen is correct? A collagen fiber is made of three parallel helices with hydrogen bonds holding them in place. It is an insoluble fibrous protein with a quaternary structure. One third of the amino acids are not valine, it's actually glycine. Okay, that's wrong. Collagen fibers are formed from several collagen molecules held together by ionic bonds. That's wrong. It's actually hyd not ionic, hydrogen. Okay, so it's between A and B. Which one is the better one? B is just the better answer. It is an insoluble fibrous protein with a quaternary structure. So what's wrong with A actually, if you guys are wondering? What's wrong with A? A collagen fiber is made up of three parallel helices. Let's see what's wrong. See this. This is from chapter two, right? So if you go to collagen, it's probably here, right? Three helices wind together to form a collagen molecule. And many of these helices, three helices, lie side by side linked to each other by covalent cross links between the side chains of amino acids near the ends of polypeptides. Okay. To form. Okay, so three polypeptide chains, like the one shown in A, make up a collagen molecule. Many collagen molecules make up a fibril. And many fibrils make up a fiber. Okay, so that's different. And the most common amino acid is actually glycine. Okay, the three strands are held together by hydrogen bonds. Remember that. 
and they're covalent cross links between the side chains of amino acids near the ends of the polypeptides for like three helices to another three helices something like that okay remember that important <clears throat> so it should have been a collagen molecule is made of three parallel helices okay now 13 which properties of water are a result of hydrogen bonding solvent action specific heat capacity latent heat of vaporization two and three The solvent action is not due to hydrogen bonding. It's just polar, okay? The polarity makes it a good solvent for polar compounds. It's not, this was not in the book and this is not, uh, you know, as a, as a result of hydrogen bonding, okay? Which descriptions about all enzymes are correct? All of them catalyze the breakdown of large molecules. Um, some of them may also catalyze, uh, you know, anabolic reactions. Okay, so this is wrong. Okay, one is wrong. Only function inside cells. No, there are some extracellular enzymes as well. So three and four are correct. Fourteen is D. 15. The cells in the roots of beetroot plant contain a red pigment. When pieces of root tissue are soaked in cold water, some of the red pigment leaks out of the cells into the water. An experiment was carried out to investigate the effect of temperature on the loss of red pigment from the root cells. It was found that the higher the temperature, the higher the rate of loss of red pigment from the root cells. Which statements could explain this trend? Enzymes in the cells denature as the temperature increases so the pigment can no longer be used for reactions inside the cells and diffuses out that literally makes no sense <laughs> like one is clearly wrong this doesn't make any sense as the temperature increases the tertiary structure of protein molecules in the cell surface membrane changes increasing the permeability this is true phospholipid molecules gain kinetic energy as the temperature rises increasing the fluidity of the membrane and allowing pigment molecules to diffuse out more easily now that's true. 2 and 3 are in fact correct, so 15 should logically be B. Okay. The diagram shows a partially plasmalized plant cell X. What is found at Z? So you guys need to understand that this is the cell membrane and this is the cell wall. So what's found in Z, this region? Basically this solution Y enters this region. So it should be solution Y. 16C, common question. 17. A single-celled organism lives in fresh water. Water that enters the cytoplasm of the cell by osmosis is collected into a structure called the contractile vacuole. To remove the water, the contractile vacuole fuses with the cell surface membrane. A student counted the number of times that the contractile vacuole filled and emptied when the cell was placed in solutions with different water potentials. The results are shown in the table. Which statement explains the pattern observed as the water potential of the external solution decreased? Let's see. The water potential gradient between the cell and solution increased, causing water to move into the cell more rapidly and the contractile vacuole to empty more frequently. Not really. As we decrease the water potential, the contractile vacuole actually empties less frequently. A is wrong. The water potential gradient between the cell and solution increased? No, it's not solution increased. Clearly, the difference decreased. That's why it did not empty anymore. At this point, the potential of that, um, you know, cell and the solution actually becomes the same. That's why it doesn't empty. C. The water potential gradient between the cell and the solution decreased, causing water to move into the cell more rapidly and more frequently no no it should be less frequently and as it decreased um, causing water to move yeah this is correct the gradient decreased and less frequently D is correct 17 D 18 which row do you get it do you get 17 basically 
as we go down the group it's becoming less frequent for sure that's why these more frequent ones are cancelled out and as we decrease the water potential the difference between the cell and solution clearly decreases. that's why the rate of emptying also decreased 18 which shows the correct number of each of components of a single chromatid during anaphase of mitosis during anaphase the chromatids basically move to this side so each chromatid basically has they're talking of about a single chromatid each chromatid has two telomeres right so two telomeres and each of them has one centromere in the middle so 18 should be a and what about dna molecules there's only one dna molecule but two dna polynucleotide strands okay really tricky but you should understand these 19 some processes are listed how many processes occur during tissue repair by stem cells okay so for tissue repair we mainly need mitosis okay so as you can see for repair we need totipotent or pluripotent basically stem cells to repair it we need cells that can differentiate into um like stem cells will differentiate into a certain type of cell suppose uh, maybe roots or something okay so of course we need dna replication mitosis and cytokinesis and we also need differentiation for the stem cell to turn into the type of cell that's required so we need all four processes okay which stage of mitosis is not shown this is actually prophase this is anaphase this is telophase and this is actually after cytokinesis has taken place so we aren't being shown metaphase metaphase is missing 20c 21 which letter in the key describes uracil okay so guys short lecture on uh, bases they are either purines or pyrimidines pyrimidines right so purines are actually the name is shorter but they're double ring double ring structures okay that's adenine and guanine okay what about pyrimidines we have thymine we have cytosine single ring structures we also have uracil okay so uracil is not a pyrene spirin sorry it has a single ring structure yes so it should be c 21 is c okay now when a gene for protease is activated which nucleic acid will be formed so basically from dna we transcribe dna to form mrna very important okay the diagram shows a vascular bundle from the stem of a plant clearly guys one look at the thickened cell wall this is clearly the lignin right this is your xylem one is basically xylem and it transports uh, mineral and ions okay so uh, i'm looking at these i'm looking at b and d okay b and c sorry yeah i'm looking at b and d now what next um store starch and transport sucrose so who actually transfers sucrose phloem right clearly so look at this these are the phloems this was the vascular bundle mainly right so this should be two should be phloem all right so the b, b should be the answer and store starch this is basically the parenchyma okay so you know it's the leaf cells the parenchyma cells from the leaf that's it this is the stem of the plant right so not leaves just parenchyma some of the features present in the transfer tissues of plants are listed which features are present in sieve tube elements okay we do not have lignified walls in sieve tube elements okay that's gone a and b are excluded it's between c and d two three and five two four and five only three or four is the determining factor okay sieve tube elements remember sieve tube elements do not have mitochondria okay that's why c is wrong d must be the correct answer it has scanty cytoplasm it do does have chloroplasts and is, it does have plasmodesmata connecting it with the companion cells okay but no mitochondria clear 25 which statement explains why transpiration is an inevitable consequence of gas exchange in plants really common mcq the answer should be d hydrolysis reactions are taking place in cells this has no connection atp production is occurring wrong stomata must be open okay stomata must be open it's an inevitable consequence of gas exchange because without stomata being open the plant cannot you know uh take in oxygen for 
take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and give out carbon dioxide right also it cannot uh, you know take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis and give out oxygen also it cannot take in oxygen for respiration right so while stomata is open stomata the right while stomata is open a water vapor also leaves the leaf that's it basically 26. In an investigation, a leafy shoot was attached to a potometer and exposed to a variety of conditions. The time taken for the meniscus to move 50 millimeters along the capillary tubing was recorded for each set of conditions. Which row shows the slowest and fastest rate of uptake for investigation? Okay. Fastest, slowest. Millimeter per second, right? So to travel 50 millimeter, it took 40 seconds to travel one millimeter. How long it will take 40 by 50 that gives us a value of 0 0.8 millimeters per second, right? And the next one 50 millimeters in 166 seconds. So 166 by 50. That's actually 3.3 one millimeter in 3.3 .3 seconds. Okay, so that's the slowest rate. 3.3 slowest and the fastest rate is 0.8 according to this my calculation basically but look uh, we aren't getting an option of 3.3 and 0.8 right we don't get that so oh, what's wrong really let's try to figure this out Which row shows the slowest and fastest rates of water uptake for the following investigation? What about the other ones? Let's do those 125 by 50. That's actually time taken to move 50 millimeters, 125 seconds. The rate is in millimeters per second. Okay, yeah, yeah, so here we actually figured it out that it took one second to travel 0.8, sorry, it took 0.8 seconds to travel one millimeter. But look at our unit, what unit do we need? We need to figure it out in one millimeter per second. You get it? It needs to be one second. We need to figure out the rate in per seconds, basically. So how are we going to do that? So the logic is, it's like this. We did it the opposite way, to be honest. Okay, sorry about that. I just did the other way around. Mainly, it should be like this. You take uh, 40 seconds to travel 50 millimeters, right? So in one second, how many millimeters should be traveled? That's actually 1.25 or 1.3 millimeters per second. Okay, this is the fastest rate. 1.3. What about the slowest one? We take 166 seconds to travel 50 millimeters. So 50 by 166 is um, in one second we travel 0 0.30 millimeter. Okay, so that's a 26 is a. 27. Proton pumps and co-transporters are used by plants when loading sucrose into a phloem safety element at a source. Which row is correct? Proton pump. Pumps protons into a companion cell, raising its pH. No, we actually pump it into the cell wall. Pumps protons out of a companion cell into its cell wall. This looks good. 27C looks good. The other descriptions are wrong.
we actually pump it out from the component cell into the cell wall of the component cell okay and then what happens the co-transporter actually brings the protons back into the component cell along with sucrose okay 28 the statements list some of the events in the cardiac cycle they are not in the correct order which statement describes the sixth of these events to occur in the cardiac cycle okay ready 28 let's start at first the sinoatrial node will contract okay then a wave of excitation sweeps across the atria do you understand then the atria will contract okay now the atrioventricular node will receive the impulse impulse sorry and delay it for a fraction of a second so that the atria can empty understood then the impulses will travel through the percant tissue then it sweeps upwards from the base of the ventricles and at last the ventricles will contract so which one occurs which is the sixth to occur that should actually be 5 d okay 29 which tissue types are present in the walls of all blood vessels okay in all blood vessels we obviously have remember only endothelial tissue because in capillaries we only have endothelium nothing else we may have elastic tissue smooth muscle tissue uh, you know in veins and arteries but no in capillary we only have endothelial tissue okay it's a trick question 30 the photomicrograph shows three white blood cells labeled x y and z so z is clearly you know it's like when you see a rim of cytoplasm it's clearly a lymphocyte okay z is a lymphocyte and remember i taught you in variant 1 1 do you see lobes in x that's a neutrophil understood x is a neutrophil right 30 should be d okay so remember if you see lobes uh you're gonna see that it's a neutrophil or a phagocyte x is a neutrophil uh z when you see a rim of cytoplasm it's gonna be a lymphocyte and when you see a kidney shaped nucleus remember that it's a monocyte okay why is a monocyte easy last section of the video 31 when active tissues have high carbon dioxide concentrations oxyhemoglobin needs to release oxygen to the tissues how is the carbon dioxide transported away by the blood from the tissues okay so maximum carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions okay maximum and then we have carb amino hemoglobin carboxyhemoglobin is carbon monoxide binded with hemoglobin not carbon dioxide so a lot of candidates get tricked but remember try to be the smart ones out there it's gonna be carb amino hemoglobin and bicarbonate some of it is dissolved in blood as well but very little parts so 31 should be c 32 which effect does increasing carbon dioxide concentration have on hemoglobin basically it causes the release of oxygen from hemoglobin okay it is less efficient at taking up oxygen and more efficient at releasing oxygen that should be our answer okay 32 should be b that's called the bohr effect right it was like this but afterwards it becomes like this it shifts to the right 33 the diagram shows a magnified section a part of the lungs containing specialized tissue hmm which is correct for structures labeled one to six i've labeled them at the top see one is actually the alveolus the epithelium of alveolus squamous epithelium two is actually the capillary endothelium okay the blood vessels three is rbc four is the alveolus itself five is the blood plasma and six is the alveolar macrophage okay it's a special type of cell in the alveoli so which contains high proportion of carbonic anhydrase we know that carbonic anhydrase is present in rbc so it should be three bicarbonate in plasma five and lysosomes in six because it's a macrophage important okay remember this guys 34 uh the table shows some of the some parts of an animal's lungs that contain different cell types okay which part of this animal's lungs clean inhaled air and which carry out gas exchange remember gas exchange is carried out by alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles alveoli basically okay and respiratory bronchioles the terminal section of bronchioles not the whole part only the terminal section remember that so 
Typically, when you're given the option, just think of it as alveoli only. You're going to think that bronchial cannot, okay? And cleaning, who is in charge of cleaning? Basically, any section that has cilia, right, for the sweeping action, goblet cells help as well because they help to stick they're sticky and help to trap dust and foreign particles. So 34, the best answer should actually be, it should only be bronch alveoli, okay? So the answer should be D, best answer, 34 D. What helps to maintain a steep oxygen concentration gradient between the air in an alveolus and the blood? Breathing in brings in a supply of air with a relatively high concentration of oxygen to the alveolus. This is true. Blood flow brings blood with low concentration of oxygen. That's true. So we get a gradient. The relatively low concentration of CO2 in the alveolus results in carbon dioxide leaving the RBC, allowing hemoglobin to combine with oxygen. Perfect. A is the correct answer. 36. Goblet cells are found in the trachea. Which cell structures would be found extensively in a goblet cell? Okay. Golgi body is required for packing. Mitochondria is required for, you know, energy. And ribosomes are required for protein glycoprotein synthesis right protein synthesis so 36 should logically be a we require all three okay malaria in a country where malaria has successfully been eliminated an outbreak of malaria can occur years later what could allow this later outbreak of malaria to occur they become resistant to insecticides sounds good migration of population due to what true malaria Parasites become resistant to quinine. That's a drug used for treatment. So yeah, all three are correct. Okay, we don't have 39, by the way. 39 is a, a question on autoimmune diseases. These have been excluded from the syllabus. Which show about a person with leukemia only and about a person with measles only is correct. So guys, leukemia is a cancer. I don't think we have measles anymore, right, in our syllabus. But still, I'm going to show you. Leukemia is a cancer of blood cells okay so uh, as a result the number of wbc in a person with leukemia only decreases okay so it's either oh, wait let me check this again white blood cell count in a person with measles only so if you have measles since it's an infection okay since it's an infection the wbc count has to increase okay so we're gonna get rid of a and c it has to increase now what about the other options bone marrow function in a person with leukemia only wbc count in a person with leukemia only okay about this basically what happens in cancer we have an uncontrolled we have uncontrolled mitosis the number of cells increases by a great margin and it is uncontrolled so yeah uh the white blood cell count in a person with leukemia only does cause an increase due to uh, uncontrolled mitosis i actually meant that the number of you know via like competent cells actually decreases but the number in general increases okay so it should be the bone marrow function in a person with leukemia only that also increase bone marrow the function of bone marrow is to produce wc wbc right so it should increase as well last one 40 tetanus is a bacterial infection the graph shows the blood antibody concentration of two people the graph shows on day one day zero person g was injected with antibodies to the tetanus toxin and h was injected with the vaccine Okay, what could be the result if H and G were infected with the tetanus bacteria on day 20? Check this out. I drew the figure afterwards. So, G was given artificial passive immunity. Do you understand? That means he does not have, he or she does not have memory cells. So, when he or she gets infected, it will be a primary response. So, it takes time to take action, you know. It takes time of about 12 days to take action as you saw in H. However, what happened to H? he already knows what the battery is like so if he or she does experience the battery again the memory cells will be quick to respond and the secondary immune response will be much faster so look at the options tetanus antibodies would not be produced in person g that's wrong it would be produced but it would take some time antibody production would peak after day 32 in person g that's true because look at this for person h it took 12 days from day zero right after the vaccine was injected so for person g he, he or she 
actually uh, was infected on day 20. So day 20 plus 12 is actually on the 32nd day. So that's true. Antibody concentration would stay constant in each person age. That's wrong. And a second antibody peak would never would occur in person age that would be lower than the first week. No. For the secondary immune response, remember the peak must be higher than the primary one. Okay. So that is it, guys. We're done with the October November 2021 series. If you like the content, remember to subscribe to the channel, right? I'm gonna link paper one up here and I'm gonna link ON 2021 variant 11 up here and ON 2021 variant 13 down here and next i'm gonna do the may june series for 2021 and march 5 2021 okay so keep on supporting the channel see you guys